with everyone having smart watches, Apple watches, like Garmin Phoenix, all that, all of them now track sleep. I'm not convinced that it's anywhere where it needs to be because you do have that, those situations where it's like, wow, my watch said I had awesome sleep. I feel like a bag of dicks. Or you, you wake up one day and you go, oh man, I feel great, but it says I didn't sleep at all. So I don't think it's there. What I, what I tend to tell my clients is work on symptoms. Like, how hard is it for you to get to sleep? Are you waking up a lot at night? Are you waking up to pee frequently? When you wake up, do you feel well rested? Do you feel like you're tanking in the middle of the afternoon? Um, we can use other, other proxies as well, like take your fasting blood sugar. If your fasting blood sugar is high and you felt like you didn't get good sleep, then it doesn't matter what your watch says, you probably didn't get good sleep. I have a lot of physicians that will say, oh, that's just not going to work. You know, it's there's there's no science behind that. And I'm sorry, but yeah, it may be a placebo effect on some patients. I mean, I'm not a huge e-stem person. I'm not a huge ultrasound. I, I do a lot of manual therapy, but she loves e-stem. You know what? If, when her back's bothering her and I do e-stem, it works. If she believes it works, then okay, we're going to do that. You know, whatever's going to make you feel better. I'm not saying put a Band-Aid on the problem either. Yes, we do need to address what's causing that issue. But in the meantime, if we're at a point where she can't move, okay, obviously I'm not going to force her to do any type of stretching or exercise. You know, I'm not going to do that yet. I've got to control her pain first. So if Eastem works to control that pain before we can move on to the next thing of her rehab, then that's what we're going to do. So the same goes for that red light. It just... And then, so I'm going to give you a little bit, I don't practice that, but I have, I work part of my, I, I do a lot of goofy things, but one of the things I do is I work in a drug rehabilitation clinic. So it's an inpatient drug rehab. So these people are going through withdrawals and they're, they're very just, you know, discombobulated. And so I go and teach nutrition and things like that. But one of the things I do tell them is if you, they do have a red light panel there, which is very progressive of them and, and awesome. I, that's kind of why I'm there, but I tell them to go get some red light or at least go get some sunshine early in the morning, something like that to really light up those like uh, neurotransmitters in the brain. It goes into the eye and it, it, it really helps them out. And so, yeah, they, they kind of like, wow, Lacey, I feel so much better. I'm like, yeah, A, you're coming off drugs, but B, you know, we're, we're helping that brain light back up again. So there's definitely something there that is, is helping that out for sure. What are your opinions on health trackers? What benefits or challenges have you experienced with them? Yeah, so yeah, that's a great question because with everyone having smart watches, Apple watches, like Garmin Phoenix, all that, all of them now track sleep. I'm not convinced that it's anywhere where it needs to be because you do have that, those situations where it's like, wow, my watch said I had awesome sleep. I feel like a bag of dicks. Or you, you wake up one day and you go, oh man, I feel great, but it says I didn't sleep at all. So I don't think it's there. What I, what I tend to tell my clients is work on symptoms. Like, how hard is it for you to get to sleep? Are you waking up a lot at night? Are you waking up to pee frequently? When you wake up, do you feel well rested? Do you feel like you're tanking in the middle of the afternoon? Um, we can use other, other proxies as well, like take your fasting blood sugar. If your fasting blood sugar is high and you felt like you didn't get good sleep, then it doesn't matter what your watch says, you probably didn't get good sleep, right? But I think the biggest hurdle is getting people into a rhythm, like having a bedtime routine, right? So uh, I was staying with a friend of mine and they had two small children and they had this whole song and dance thing after dinner. Like, what time is it? Bedtime routine. And everybody start dancing. And then, then they put the kid to bed. I think people need to have more of that because we don't have a lot of structure when we sleep. People will stay up too late. They're, they're working or, oh, I'm going to, I'm really into this movie on Netflix. It's like, bro, you, you should have been in bed like two hours ago. It's like the most important thing is having a, a, a protocol of going to sleep at the same time, trying to wake up at the same time. But I think probably the most important thing is waking up at the same time every day. Even if you're not going to get enough sleep, maybe take an afternoon nap if you can. But it's really important to build that rhythm so that your brain knows when it's time to sleep, when it's time to wake up, right? So, and then I'll use a lot of supplementation if I need to. We'll use you know, melatonin, we'll use valerian root, we'll use Finibut, if I can find it, you know, there's a lot of different things. Like right now, Finibut's illegal in Australia, so I probably shouldn't say this, but I bought like a kilo of it when they got banned. <laughs> I don't keep it at my house. If you're listening to this, uh, police of Australia, but yeah, we'll, 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 we 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 don't want to use like a lot of pills to like force people to sleep. 
but sometimes they're good to use to build a pattern. Like maybe I take a little bit of valerian root extract and maybe a little melatonin, maybe I took whatever I need to do to get the sleep at the same time and then try to wake up at the same time and not be dependent on a lot of stimulants uh, over the day. So we'll give them strategies like that and setting up a bedroom how it should be when you're asleep, like setting like a bat cave, making sure it's nice and cold, add more sheets if you need to, have good airflow, as little sound as possible, as little light as possible. Like if you can do a lot of that, that's going to set them up set them up pretty decently. And then looking at what you're eating, don't eat too close to bedtime, cut the stimulants off really early because caffeine can have an effect on your sleep uh, nine, nine hours from the last cup of coffee that you had, right? And I know a lot of people here, they're gonna walk through the expo. What do you think the first thing they're gonna look for for the freebies? Energy drinks, yeah. And you're gonna see people just like sculling energy drinks all day, right? And we've gotta get people out, out of that. You, that's giving you a false sense of energy. There's no energy in these drinks. It just reduces your perception of being fatigued. So I'd rather people learn how to actually make energy using the food that they're eating and then good deep restful sleep so that their biochemistry works properly and also stress management. If we were to purchase our own food line, what do we do? I'm sure there are probably junk ones out there. Like it's not just the fact it's red, right? Like there's a certain wavelength I'm assuming it depends on what you're looking to use it for, to be honest with you, because there's medical grade ones and then there's all the ones you see on Amazon, you know? So, and I mean, the prices vary. You can get one for 40 bucks, you can spend 300 bucks, you spend $2,000 on one, but it really just depends on what you're using it for. Some of them are, you know, combined with like blue light, some of them are, you know, red light with the infrared light. So if you're looking, looking to rejuvenate skin, you know, or something more superficial, you know, you don't, you just basically need the red light versus the infrared light, you're gonna get deeper tissue penetrations, like one and a half inches of depth in there. So that's more for like pain, reducing inflammation, that kind of thing. So it really depends on what your purpose is. Has anyone tried IV light therapy or ozone therapy? I've heard about it, but don't know much. I'd love to hear your experiences. My, my doctor's Dr. Serrano in Columbus, Ohio, and it's called EBU. It's like extracorporeal blood oxygen something that I can't say. If you look up EBOO, it's like he, he says it's like ozone on steroids and it does look like a dialysis and it filters through everything. And I, it felt no different than an, an IV. You just have two IVs. You can't really play on your phone. That's what it was annoying. <laughs> Other than that, I, I really can't explain it the way he can, but it, it, he uses it also for injuries, vaccine injury, athletes, and he pairs it with hyperbaric. Oh, okay. So, as well, yeah. yeah. I might just hijack because I've got the talking stick. Did you want to just add your point on liver for sleep? Yeah. Because I think that's really interesting. Well, not liver for sleep, but um, your question about the liver to get enough choline, now the it's not... It becomes a question, too, of not like, are you getting enough choline, but are you getting too much of other things like vitamin A and iron, right? So if you're eating way too much, um, especially trying to get choline back to a normal level, it's a, it's a good chance you're probably going to overconsume iron and possibly vitamin A as well. How does the quality of an animal's diet and health influence the nutrient content of meat and animal products? I mean, ideally, you know, all meat should come from the, the highest quality source for, for multiple reasons, but particularly when you're looking at Organ. When you're looking at meat in general, or animal products, the nutrients are going to be higher based on the quality that is pumping out there. The, 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 the nutrient content is going to be influenced by the quality of the animal's diet and the health of the animal. You know, particularly you know, when we're looking at milk, for example, you, I would rather drink the milk of a healthy cow than a sick cow. That's, for, and, you know, that's very clear. So when we look at particularly like grass-fed meat, like we have amazing beef in Australia, and when you look at like a grass-fed like ribeye steak versus one just from the supermarket, and even our supermarket meat in Australia is way better than here. But you, you can see the vitamin A content in the fat. You can see the color of the fat is very different. So I think if we're looking particularly at eating liver, particularly if we maybe don't enjoy the taste of liver and we're just getting it down to get the nutrients in, that's me. I would rather make sure that I'm getting that from the highest quality source to get the most bang for my buck, but also recognizing that because it is a detoxification organ, if the animal is sick, that's where it's going to be holding onto a whole bunch of the crap. So absolutely, when it comes to organ meat, I would be making sure to only get it from a very good quality source. And one of the best things you can do is, you know, contact a local uh, farm that does organ meats or they can sell it to you direct and getting it as fresh as possible as well, particularly if you're going to freeze it, you want to freeze it fresh. 
And for the people who are going to eat it raw, which, you know, up to people to do what they want, make sure that it's been like properly frozen for a long period of time, just for the case that there may be parasites in it, just to make sure that they will die from the freezing process. Um, that is also extremely important if people are going to do that. And do you have a, for people who don't like liver, like a good desiccated liver tablet? Absolutely. Yeah. So I use the liver capsules, particularly when I'm traveling, when I'm in Lithuania, I'll, I'll, I'll have liver, but the reason why I use the capsules when I'm traveling is because when I do consume it from a dietary standpoint, it makes me feel fantastic. So I like to be able to have access to that. So the, the desiccated organ capsules are a fantastic option. And the brands that I personally like for people who are from Australia, if anyone's watching this, there's a brand called NextGen, N-X-G-E-N. Um, they're an Australian company. There's a, there's a bunch over here in the States. I think Heart and Soil, Ancestral Supplements, they're, they're ones here. I use a brand called Code Age. That's a fantastic one. It's an, uh, You want to make sure that when you're getting desiccated beef liver, it hasn't been defatted. So a lot of the cheap brands, I think Universal make one that's defatted. But a lot of these defatted organ capsules, they've been so heavily processed, number one, but a lot of the nutrients are in the fat in the liver. So it's very important to get a good quality one that has been minimally processed. So Code Age is a great brand. And then people in Europe or the UK, uh, there's a brand called Nutriest up in Estonia, um, and they do fantastic ones as well. They also do it in a powder, which I tried myself and I realized that the powder is for pets. It, uh, it will stick to the roof of your mouth if you try to dry scoop it. And yeah, so yeah, don't do that. So you can get that for your pets, not for, not for humans. So before I ask my next question, I wanted to kind of t piggyback on that with high quality food. So being a dietitian, I think people watch too many TikTok videos, right? And, oh, but I can't eat this and I can't eat that, and superfood this, and, and they make food so complicated, it blows my mind. It's one, sometimes I really take like two, two big pieces of information. I'm like, just sit and think for this for a second. If, it, if the earth gave it to us, it's probably okay. Like animal foods and fruits and things like that, like, and it makes you feel good, great. The other thing is always remember, remember we always told as kids, you are what you eat? There is nothing more truer than that. Absolutely nothing more truer than that statement because everything you eat becomes a part of your cells somewhere. So do you want Cheetos in your cells or do you want animal protein in your cells? Like, what do you want there? And I think sometimes people don't make that connection that their food actually becomes part of them. I don't think they believe that. Um, for some reason, it's more of an emotional connection to it versus let's feel what our food actually feels like. And and so when you brought up good quality food, I think that's so important that people look at that and go, ah, that does, that makes me feel good. Not up here, but here. So um, those are always my two big takeaways for just step away from the noise and just look at your food differently. Can you comment a little bit on this trend towards the carnivore diet? I have so many people following a carnivore diet now. No, I, okay, so when it comes to different diets that are out there, I think there's, there's, benefit to many of them as long as they follow those principles of food came from earth and does it make you feel good so the carnivore diet has evolved over time to something that i can almost i don't get back behind it 100 percent, but it's the base of animal meat great i want muscles so i'm going to eat them and then fruits for carbs naturally occurring carbs some good healthy dairy foods that are, are naturally occurring you know we're getting our carbs from other places and, you know, maybe we're cutting out some of those, you know, inflammatory veggies, some of the things that create problems in an autoimmune type person. I think there's a place for it. But do I think there's also a place for, I don't think people should be vegan, but okay, some people can do it. Do I think I, I'm not there? My sister is, I'm, I'm not. But people feel good doing it. If you do and you're getting all your nutrients and you're supplementing, okay. As long as, again, we're kind of following those principles. So I, I don't really go good or bad on anything. It's more, okay, let's figure out what you're doing, what works for you. And if eating a good high protein diet feels good, let's do it. You know, it, it's funny when I started reading into it, I looked at what I, I tend to eat. Here's my three things. I eat meats, roots, and fruits. That's really the extent of what I eat. It makes me feel good. It gets kind of some of my pain and inflammation away and, and I, it works for me. So when I saw, I was like, oh, there might be a little something there and it may work for some people. So I'm not anti for sure. So are you seeing like a common trend between those patients that are on the carnivore diet, like certain issues or I, I think it's certainly 
the big thing is there's such a media push to this when you look at you know you know Shami, you look at like you know carnivore doc and you know this there's such a big media push to it that i have a lot of patients now coming in and saying looks like the best thing for me is just to eat and and they are taking to the carnivore diet is really literally they do not eat fruits yeah, they yeah, just are eating cool. meat you know i i do think sometimes and i it's it's really just because you've taken everything else in anti-inflammatory other diet they all have people who had really shitty immune diseases and they feel better on a carnivore diet and i always advocate to them i think that's fine to do temporarily that's going to get you back on track and you know it's it's sort of a brain dead way of eliminating everything bad that you could eat since you're not eating processed foods you're not eating sugars and all those things that are inflammatory to you uh, and I, but i tell people over the long term i think you need more fiber in your diet i think you need other things to support it um you know i, I don't think you can survive on just carnivore diet although if you look at some of the people who are pro carnivore they seem pretty well <laughs> But it comes down to educating them as well, because if they don't know how to do it right, a lot of people go into these diets and they just go head into it and they have no clue how to balance nutrients doing it correctly. Right. So I think that's also, we, we have to educate how to do it right. So if you want to do it, let's do it right. Yeah, I want to comment because you and I probably share this. And, you know, the number of sort of stem cell clinics that people come in, they get their stem cells. And, you know, as we know, you can throw all the regenerative medicine at somebody, and if their overall health is not there, right, they haven't established good autophagy, for instance, you know, one of the things we have to do is get rid of senescent cells. And if I'm just throwing a bunch of stem cells into you and you've done nothing to correct the underlying dysfunction in the first place, it, it's not going to work. And it's why the data, when you look at the data on stem cells for, for joints, for instance, in general, it's positive. But there's a lot of studies that say it does nothing. And I would say it does nothing if you are somebody who has not optimized your health first. So before we'll ever have somebody spend, and we do a lot of uh, extracellular vesicles, exosome therapies, both inter, you know, IV for autoimmune diseases and things, but I do a lot of joints. I actually do do spines. And I will tell people we will spend the first three months before we do that actually getting you into a state where this is going to do any good instead of you spending $5,000 for these treatments that are going to be absolutely useless. And so... The data is so skewed by the fact that these studies are looking at the typical person who is big fat and eating the standard American diet, wanting to have their knee injected with stem cells and feeling like they're going to be better. Uh, and so you've got to spend time. If you're going to think about regenerative therapies, you've got to spend time on getting your health in order first, or is it a big waste of your money? I agree. I will, I'll, I will turn patients away if they come in and they're like, yeah, I have arthritis in my knee and they're taking a statin and they're taking blood pressure medicine and they're, you know overweight they're you know I ask them about their activity and when at the point with activity if it's restricted to pain you know what else can you do if it's your knee that's hurting are you doing some upper body are you like you can you can activate something so it depends on their level of effort and then I'll tell them okay we have to clean all this up first and it's almost like oh what yeah Uh, I you know I had a a gentleman argue with me he's like I'm here to give you money and I was like that's not that's not what's gonna that's not what's going to be the best thing for you. I won't be able to sleep as well at night if I know that your environment is not going to allow these cells to do their work. We have to work on this. And they'll they'll leave and they'll go somewhere else and they'll come back and they'll tell me, you're the first person that was ever honest with me. Yeah. And, I mean, that that's huge. When you have that, when you, when you build that trust and you build that, the real reason why we're all here, we just want to take care of people, you know? Yeah. I think that, and, you know, You've learned this through the years. So there's two different types of stem cells, guys, and, and there's autologous, meaning it's coming from your own body. So we're basically taking fat or we're taking bone marrow, and I did that for years on people, and there's some great studies that came out of China recently that actually showed if you take somebody who typically has arthritis and you take their own stem cells and you put them back into their joint, it actually initially they get a little anti-inflammatory effect, and then actually starts killing the chondrocytes around them. So their own stem cells actually had enough senescent damaged cells that when you inject into a joint, they spewed out proteins. That's why we call them zombie cells. They spew out proteins and they damage the cells around them. So it's one of the reasons, you know, you and I probably don't use autologous cells as, I don't know if you do, but I don't, you know, because I tell people, listen, you know, your own cells, unfortunately, unless you're an 18 year old, super healthy person are probably not going to do the job for you where you have to go through more mesenchymal stem cells or we use, we use umbilical source exosomes you're going to get a lot better result. And the studies are out there, and yet people are doing it over and over again. I mean, this is a really good study out of China. I can't remember the, the, the journal that came out, it came where they really showed, you know, this is cell death of using autologous stem cells in people who already had arthritis. If there's a reason you have arthritis, a lot of times there's actually a genetic basis for it. We know this inflammatory cytokine. So there's the same information. So I really caution people against doing this kind of autologous pe- you know, procedures that are all over the place anymore. First of all, get your health in order and then use a really healthy source of cells to actually get yourself better.
That makes sense. Like, why put your own six cells back in your cell? Right. Yeah. Well, there, I, I have a theory on that one. I think it's a familiarity. Oh, they want and their... So, you know, just like-minded, that makes... You know, mm-hmm. if you get like-minded people, they tend to collect together. If you have senescent cells that are just spewing out all this junk and you concentrate it and put it back in, it's like, oh, oh it's okay. here. I'm going to make it worse for you. But... So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's how I see it. It's just, it's, it's a recognition because yeah. you're... It's your own cells. It's your own biology. It's your own deficiencies. You're just putting that all right back in. That's why I like to, I don't use, I don't do PRP. I won't do, you know, autologous cells. Same reason. Just, just yeah, know, putting all your own baby yeah. cells in. So I'm going to ask Allie and Dr. Yurth. We were talking out front about, so the afternoon session, we're going to talk about performance enhancement and testosterone and all that kind of good stuff. But there's application for these things as well in a preventative slash regenerative type therapy. So I was talking to Ali about things like oxandrolone and Winstrol and those types of, of medications and their use in regeneration versus performance enhancement. And then maybe some of the peptides that you use in that regard as well. So kind of just touch on. Don't know exactly what to say about it. <laughs> what did you, so in your, in your, with your clients, those who are using those types of medications, not just for performance enhancement. What have you seen in overall health quality, life quality, things like that? So I will say that the majority of my guys who are on TRT now watch too much YouTube, too much TikTok and all that. So they're like, what are the add-ons that I can throw on there and do? It's TRT plus or something. Yes. Super Super TRT, sports TRT, whatever the fuck it is. Like there's all these terms now. So they're like, what about Anabar? And they don't know why. They just know that it's, Yes, it's on TikTok and it's a lot of the clinics like in South Florida and where I live, you can walk into any clinic and pretty much write your name on a piece of paper. They'll give you a script for anything that you want. I had a doctor uh, who goes to my gym, spotted me on bench press and he was like, you know, do you compete? And I called Rick after this story and I was like, no, he's like, well, I take care of all the competitors here. I manage six clinics in Florida. I was like, red flag. And he's like, we can get you whatever you want. If you want Anavar, if you want Winstrol, we even have prescription D-Ball and Anadrol. And, and I'm like thinking, how the fuck? I just met you, bro. Like, literally, you don't even know who I am. And uh, so I call Rick and I'm like, you know, Rick's like, yeah, send him my number. He's going to need it pretty soon. Do you, did you get his number? Yeah, I'll give it to you. Okay. <laughs> You'll meet him when we go train tomorrow. Um. But anyway, to get back to your question, that is something I leave up to the medical professionals in my network because I don't feel, number one, I don't want to have to call Rick for that reason. Number two, it, it's something that I'm not comfortable advising them because God knows what they're going to say that Ali said and then word spreads and then I got inquiries for being the PED coach, which I do not want to be known for. So I leave that completely up to whatever is allowed to be prescribed to the medical practitioner that they're dealing with. So so we you do use anabolic sometimes to help healing and recovery. And in general, in our practice, we'll use nandrolone because there's a, I'm going to go always after medical literature. So I'm going to always go and find scientific studies that can support everything I'm doing. And I, and I try and make sure it's pulled from the journals that everybody appreciates as real journals. And so there is three studies on nandrolone post-total joint replacement, which showed marked recovery. There's a study on rotator cuff repair showing marked recovery. We know for fracture healing, it it shows marked recovery. So I'm going to pull from the data and say, I can use this and defend why I'm using nandrolone in my 80-year-old. But I will tell you that the, the combination of, and I'll use myself as an example, I had tore my rotator cuff lifting, doing inclined dumbbell presses seven weeks ago. Complete tear, completely ripped off my supraspinatus and my subscap. It was just couldn't move my arm at all. Yeah, and so I was fortunate enough to, you know, be having my friend who's a surgeon fix it. And I said, I gave him, you know, a bottle of exosomes. I said, please throw this in at the time of surgery. So I have no idea what they are, but fine. You know, so he threw in some <laughs> exosomes at the time of the surgery. I actually wore my sling for one day. You're supposed to wear it for six weeks after a rotator cuff repair for one day. I was in the gym the next day lifting with my left arm. Um, I did wear my sling that first day afterwards to protect it. But after that, I took it off because there was zero data to support that not moving the joint does anything except make us as surgeons feel better. Uh, so, you know, started moving it gently, you know, being careful. And at seven weeks, I'm about where most people are at six months. Am I still very weak and can't do a whole lot with it? Yes. But I'm at seven weeks where most people are still just getting out of their sling. But what did I do? I had them throw exosomes at the time of this procedure. I started nandrolone 
injected right away. I started peptides, so BPC, thymus, and beta-4 are re- what we call recovery peptides, and um, they can be done orally as supplements even. So they'll, as there's some FDA question now on peptides that we can use, you can do BPC, thymus, and beta-4 as oral supplements, and they are not, they're still available as oral supplements. I prefer injecting them close to the site, so I've been injecting them near my shoulder every day at a high dose. So with that protocol, I'm, again, six months ahead of the standard person. I went back to my friend who's, my, who's a surgeon who fixed it. I said, so you're going to change any of your protocol? He's like, nah. You know, so that's why medicine is, you know, and, and you, I get it because I can't fix your shoulder and then say, go do anything you want, right? Because then if you screwed up, you can come back and say, you told me I could do this. So we err to the side of caution in medicine. We we're always erring to the side of not getting sued. So instead, it's a lot easier to immobilize somebody for six weeks and then really gently start them when that may not be the best treatment course. So I, I will say that anabolics, and we'll use them in all of our, if they, people have told joints, if they have surgery, if I have an 80-year-old who has a vertebral fracture, an osteoporotic vertebral fracture, dramatic healing that you will not see. Remember, it's 15 times more anabolic than testosterone, so you can get that nice, really anabolic effect. And sometimes you don't need a huge, long course of it, but it, I will tell you guys, from my experience, it is dramatic. There's also some very interesting studies on nandrolone and rheumatoid arthritis. So there actually is a lot of pain relief for people when you put them on nandrolone. So I have some people, it's very hard for me to get them off of it, to cycle off of it, because they feel, some of my people who have systemic arthritis feel so much better on it. So if you're considering testosterone replacement therapy, TRT, why not reach out to one of our doctors at Balance My Hormones, where you can get just a simple advice call for only $59.95, Also, whilst you're watching the channel, don't forget to subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell so you get the latest content from Balance My Hormones. Until next time, this is Mike, and wishing you the best of health.